Jason joins me now. Jason, thank you so much Great to be with for you. joining us. It, it's it's a half a lifetime ago. I, when I was reading about the fact that it happened in the 80s, but can you can you give us your personal experience? Sure. Starting as early as you can, really. So, I mean, my, my first kind of direct memories at, at all are seeing my dad alive for the last time, which was my fourth birthday in 1993. He'd chosen to die at his parents' house. He was, you know, dying of AIDS at, at, at this point uh, in that summer of 93. And I, I can remember being stood in that room holding, you know, the first Game Boy with the, the purple buttons on it and having no sense, you know, that my dad was dying, um, but he was in the bed, you know, lots of wires, lots of... And then really, you know, after that, I kind of have this vague memory of being at the funeral and everyone crying and the casket and, you know, that, those are my first memories. They're not happy memories, they're, they're devastating memories. And so, yeah, I mean, I was, you know, born into the aftermath of, of this scandal, really, but it would be a, a learning curve for me growing up as to the true depths of how that all happened. And were the elders around you, you know, you're a little boy at this point, were the elders around you as energised, as, as angry and as, 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 as demanding of, of, of explanations? Well, you know, before, before my dad actually died, I have, I have a letter at home in uh, 1990, so I would have been one. Uh, myself and my dad went to see his then MP, David uh, Lightbound, Conservative MP at the time. Um, and the letter says, you know, it's from that MP to my dad saying, thank you for coming to see me at my surgery with your child the other day. And my dad was campaigning for mm -hmm. compensation at that time. So he was campaigning. But to be honest with you, I think when my dad died, I think everyone was just so devastated by what had happened. There was, I think there was little sense at that time, you know, within my family that people were going to start campaigning, to be honest. I think everyone was just so destroying, especially with the stigma of AIDS at that time. Oh. Um, I mean, something that we're literally dealing with at the moment. Um, even over the last week, I've been speaking but, but, to... But there's so much attribution of blame around HIV at that time. Yes. It was so misunderstood but exactly what it was and, and how people had come to be in that predicament. Especially someone like your dad, who received it purely from a, a, a medical procedure that he, he was assured by all of the relevant authorities was going to prolong his life. Well, that, well, that's right. I mean, at the time, there was the, the famous quote from, uh, I think it was the chief of the Manchester police at the time, uh, who said that AIDS victims were swirling in a cesspit of their own making. That was the attitude of many, many people um, at, at the time. You know, in my dad's personal case, I know before I, I was born, there was all, all kinds of... They had a knock at the door one day, my parents, from uh, a neighbour that lived on their cul-de-sac, saying um, that she had informed all of the neighbours um, that my dad um, had AIDS after, or HIV after they confided in her because she felt it was her moral duty to let everybody know. My mum uh, was sacked. She worked at a, a bakery and uh, she was sacked from her job because the, the guy that ran the bakery said she was a risk to staff and customers. Frank, this is a tragedy and a scandal in every possible sense of the words, is it not? It is. I mean, when you, when you think about it, you know, some, you wake up in the morning and you probably don't even know why this happens to you. Mm. And you kind of wonder, well, where is it going to lead to? And, and you realize that somehow these forces beyond your control have turned your world upside down and are going to lead to your death. That's just a, that, that is the, almost like a Greek tragedy in the making. Where are you with the campaign now? I mean, it's been decades. Where, has anyone been compensated? Is there any worthwhile development in the story? So, yeah, I, I think, you know, just picking up there about things being outside of people's control, I think it's really important for people to understand, with the blood scandal, what's really at the centre of it isn't, it's not blood transfusions, it was this uh, blood product called Factor Eight, which was made by mixing together tens of thousands of plasma donations from often high-risk donors from, you know, we know, I'm sure people have heard from American prisons, Skid Row locations, etc. mixing them all together. And from drug addicts and uh, other people who'd been, who had been mixing their blood. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then it's then um, turned into this freeze-dried white powder, which can be then dissolved. And the problem is, you get one infected donor, infects the whole batch, and every single bottle of Factor 8 was infected with hepatitis C. 
uh, th through the 70s and then a the large portion in the 80s, but where we are with the campaign now. Um, so people who uh, were infected who are still alive uh, or uh, bereaved widows uh, in October 2022 received an interim compensation payment of £100,000, which was welcome, but um, the problem with that was two-thirds uh, of bereaved families are from where uh, a person died not in relationship. So, for example, 380 of the HIV victims were, were children, and more than half of those have died. So, basically, if you died and you weren't in a relationship when you died, so far, your family has got nothing. And we're talking about some of the very worst cases. Just one, one example. It's truly heartbreaking um, in our community. There's a guy called Sam Rushby. His father was infected with HIV, unwittingly infected his mother, who was pregnant, gave birth to a HIV-positive daughter, who the daughter died at three months old, but his whole family was dead from AIDS by the time he was three years old. No compensation in that case. And the fight just goes on? On and on, grinding away daily. The, the government, right now, their position is uh, they're not doing anything more until the inquiry publishes its final report on the 20th of May. But the inquiry is very clear last April in 23, don't wait for the final report. So Brian Langstaff, the chair, said to the government, do this now. Get on with the compensation. Make interim payments to the bereaved families. But the government haven't moved. I'm running out of time now. I will hope that you can come back and update us on this story again. But thank you for bringing it to our attention at the moment, Jason sure. Evans. Thank you.